Hi class, so in the last video we looked at Renaissance and Baroque art and we really talked about the revival of the past and then the calm, balanced art and architecture of the Renaissance in opposition to the high emotion, high contrast of Baroque art. In this video we're really going to be looking at as big of a difference as we move into the 18th century with Rococo and then moving on to Neoclassicism and Romanticism within the same section. So when we talk about these various uh, styles, we're still looking around the mid 18th century, so 1700s. And this is really the same time as Baroque, but you'll see a significant shift in styles as we move into Rococo, which is what we will start off with first is kind of Rococo and then the response to Rococo from in 18, just what's called 18th century art. So this is again still in the time of the Baroque period, but we're in France. This is the Palace of Versailles and we're really going to see a much more ornate style. Um, Versailles was built by France's King Louis XIV, who was also known as the Sun King. And with all of the lights and the brightness, you really can see why in the Hall of Mirrors from Versailles. Um, this, in, for Versailles, he really commissioned the finest artists in Europe to construct and decorate it as the largest palace in the world. Um, this is the Hall of Mirrors, which he used as a ballroom. And today we would look at this and say, oh, very large, extremely ornate, lots of mirrors and not think much about it. But mirrors were relatively new as far as the development and how they were created at this time, and they were extremely expensive. So running down this hall with 17 large arches, and then directly across the, each of these arches is a mirror that helps reflect the light coming in from the arches, made this one of the most expensive halls in the entire palace. And this wasn't just the, the decoration for this hall in particular. This was kind of palace wide, this extravagance and ornateness. Everything is gilded, very bright, very shiny. Um, the chandeliers, the sculpture, the paintings, everything has this kind of golden tones to it. And you can definitely see here with everything completely covered in fabric and in floral motifs. And so when we talk about Rococo, Rococo really is an extension of the Baroque style. The name Rococo is a play on the word Baroque, which refers to French words for rocks and shells that often appear as decorative motifs in architecture and the furniture of this period. Uh, Rococo is very extravagant, ornate, much as Baroque was too, but just in a completely different way. Um, Rococo really is the mid 18th century in France. So what we looked at for the most part, Baroque was in Italy, and then we also looked a little bit of Dutch Baroque. So now we're moving into France, and it was very specific to this region, um, this style was. So when we talk about Rococo, we're really talking about things that are extravagant to the point of being frivolous. Even the word Rococo is very decorative -y sounding. Um, this was very, very much an upper class style. This is not something that your everyday person could afford in any possible way. So kind of keep that in mind as we move into the painting we're going to look at, The Swing by Jean-Honoré Fragonard. Now The Swing is very much a representative of this Rococo style through the poofiness of our figure's dress we have on the swing. She is on actually on a swing of um, gold and red velvet. She is in this beautiful wood surrounded by these very fluffy trees, lots of flowers, the statuary. And if you start looking at our statues, they really suggest what's going on here. Um, we have these Cupid figures, uh, these puti that are kind of around um, in this sort of pleasure garden. And they're sort of kind of saying, oh, shh, be quiet. If you notice our figure directly on the on far left, I'm sorry, our statue on the left, looking down at the figure telling, almost shushing him. Um, and on our right, the older man who is swinging her, 
is her uncle or kind of a um, um, caretaker figure. And then we have our, our young man on the left who is kind of hidden in the bushes unbeknownst to the older man. And she is flirting with him as she swings and she swings her foot up in the air and her shoe flies off. Well, you know, we don't think anything about that, but this is a very suggestive painting for this period. Um, it really shows the pleasure of the upper classes. And when she kicks off her shoe, it's likely it's going to land in the lap of the statue or the young man that is watching her. And again, very suggestive. Um, and it's really turns, the shoes almost turned into this expression of carefree sexuality or sort of a rising passion. Um, the shoe flying off toward the cupid figure is really suggestive of love and sexuality. Um, it also may represent lost virginity with this naked foot and what will be lost besides the shoe. Um, and then the sculpture in the center is a picture of dolphins pulling cupids, which really is at this time symbolic of a surge of love. So dolphins um, bringing the cupids along the waves. And then if you notice right next to the older figure, and it's kind of hard to see in this picture of it, there's actually a little dog next to him that's barking, kind of trying to alert him to the dangers of this youth and the sexuality that's happening here. So this is a very risque painting, um, but it is very much in the Rococo style. These pinks and very light colors, very non-serious um, subjects, these fluffy, like almost cotton candy looking colors and trees and all of this, everything is very fluffy here. It's very, very decorative. And so um, it's it's been referred to as aristocratic cotton candy even. So this really is one side of art, particularly in France in the 18th century. Um, and so we go from this, this very aristocratic, very upper class work art to Hogarth, which is 18th century art, not Rococo. So this is kind of another whole little section in response to Rococo or kind of in opposition of Rococo. Um, and this simply would be referred to as 18th century art. Now, William Hogarth is very openly critical of the aristocratic classes. And this series of paintings that the marriage settlement belongs to is called Marriage a la Mode or A Fashionable Marriage. And it's a series of six paintings and that tell the story of our two figures on the left, the bride and groom, and um, kind of how things happen through this arranged marriage. Now, we can see and it's this this marriage is this very narcissistic syphilis infected boy who we see in the groom on the far left and you see the black dot under his ear this suggests that he has syphilis already so he's not going into this the most pure person as it is and then we have um the br his bride to be who's next to him flirting with the lawyer doctor um uh silver tongue the lawyer and then we have these two dogs below them, which we talked about earlier, how dogs represent fidelity. And that's great, we have a couple, but if you notice, these two dogs are shackled together. So this is not the best for foreboding for, this is a little foreboding for our couple. And then on the right, we have their fathers that are bringing to the table what is, what they have to the marriage. And the, fig, the father on the left, is this nouveau riche and if you notice in the background there's this architect that's overseeing the building of a house presumably for the couple um and our father figure who is the nouveau riche he is dressed in clothes that are just a little too big for him not quite in step he hasn't quite gotten this whole aristocratic style down yet um and then our figure on the right in the ruffled velvet, very traditional aristocratic clothing. If you notice, it looks a little worn. Um, there's a few tear spots 
as you start getting start looking around his clothing, really suggesting that while he has the title, he no longer has the money. So he is pointing to his family tree, showing what he's bringing to the table of the marriage, which is the title um, and the good family name. So, or at least the, the wealthy family name. And he has in front of him a purse filled with gold coins, which would be the dowry of the girl. So each father is getting, each family is getting something that they need out of this. Well, the couple, neither one seems super thrilled about this. So um, everyone is very much self-interested and it goes through kind of their marriage. And the series ends with the groom dying in prison for killing the wife's lover and the wife dying from syphilis she got from both her and her husband's affairs. So not the most positive spin on the aristocratic life like we were looking at with the Rococo. So, um, so keep that in mind. These are two completely separate styles. Um, Rococo with the very frilly, highly positive, um, very fun upper class, and then the 18th century, which is not the most positive. Um, and again, more of a response to the Rococo style than a style on its, all on its own. Okay, so let's move on to neoclassicism. And this really begins with the French Revolution in 1789, and artists really started to lead the way in art and in politics as well. Um, neoclassicism was really a child of the age of reason or the age of enlightenment, when philosophers believed that we'd be able to control our destinies by learning from and following the laws of nature, um, and even the United States was founded on the Enlightenment philosophy. So this is a very politically weighty movement. Um, neoclassicism is very much characterized by a clarity of form, sober colors, a very shallow space. So this doesn't, most of the works don't appear very deep. Um, and then strong horizontals and verticals that render sort of this timeless subject matter instead of these, instead of very dynamic, like we looked at in Baroque and even in Rococo a little. And then a classical subject matter or classicizing something that's very contemporary. And we can see that here in Jacques-Louis David's The Oath of the Horatii. Um, David really felt that art should serve a social purpose. Um, and this was in a time of social and governmental reform. So it very much was lending itself to what was happening around us. And he really rejected the frivolity and the immortality of the aristocratic aristocratic Rococo. Um, with this painting, he really does pioneer the neoclassic style or neoclassic or new classicism. And again, we're looking back to Greeks and Romans, much like we did in the Renaissance, but just in kind of a different way. To the neoclassicists, um, Rome really represented a republican or non-hereditary government. This was a government not ruled by families. Um, you weren't guaranteed just because your father ruled that your son would. This was very much a political thing. And the Oath of the Horatia is a story of virtuous and ready to die for liberty and um, in defense of their country. So the story behind this actually is the three brothers pledged to take swords from their father to defend Rome. And they were going off to fight as representatives of Rome and a warring state. And um, they had decided rather than both cities completely going to war, they would have representatives fight it out. And be between the two, whoever won, that state won or that city won. The problem is, if we notice our, our female figures on the right, we have um, Everyone looks very upset. Of course, they're worried about the sons going off to war. The father will lose all three of his um, male heirs if they all die. And the women lose their husbands or their brothers. And the other problem is one of our women, her fiance, is one of the other three men battling it out. So regardless of who wins, she loses. She loses either her brothers or she loses her fiance. And all of this is set in a very, very classical theme um, and really meant 
to provide this historically appropriate setting for these Roman figures that we see here. Um, it divides the say, stage into sons, and then the father, and then the women, which are just overcome by emotion. And, but we have these very classical figures. Um, again, in a time of government turmoil and things, this is very much a contemporary subject set in a classical mode. Um, and again, if we look at the composition itself, it's very shallow. There's not much past the, the columns that we're seeing here. And again, very much classical forms. Um, our women look very much like a number of the Greek and Roman sculptures that we looked at a couple of sections back and the idea of their dress and everything as well. So again, classic subject, contemporary or classic figures, contemporary subject. And a female artist within this neoclassic style is Angelica Kaufman. Um, like Artemisia Gentileschi, she was trained by her father, so she was allowed to, to be trained as an artist. And she really spent time in Italy before settling into London. Um, she was one of the first, very first women to be elected into the London Royal Academy of Arts. And she was a very, she was very popular during her own time, which was unlike a number of our other artists that we have looked at. Now, Kaufman really dealt with subjects that were kind of closer to home. Um, she dealt with more female type subjects. Um, and Cornelia pointing to her children as her treasures is definitely a, a feminine subject. And we have Cornelia, who is um, our figure in the middle, and her friend is showing her a string of jewels and boasting about, you know, if you weren't married and weren't off having kids constantly, you too could have treasures like this and this beautiful gold chain and all of these jewels that she was wearing. Well, Cornelia responds that her children are her jewels um, and that they are as important to her as the jewels are to this woman. And it's actually very historically accurate um, because Cornelia's children do go on to become very important figures in the Roman Republic. So this is definitely a comment on um, being, it's very important to raise children and to stay at home and take care of her family as is, is, is as important as obtaining wealth um, because your children can be your wealth. So again, very much in a neoclassic setting, the dis, the the background is very much Italian, and um, we have all of our figures in very traditional Roman garb, these togas, the drapery, and um, even the hairstyles and everything else would be very traditionally Roman, but a very contemporary subject for the modern, modern to her time in the 18th century. Okay, the neoclassic style also extends to architecture, but when, it's, but when it's in the structure of the United States, it's referred to as the federal style. Now, this is Thomas Jefferson's Monticello. <clears throat> Excuse me. And Jefferson spent a number of years in Europe. He was there for five years as the minister to France. And when he came home after seeing all of the, all of the architecture in Rome and abroad, he redesigned his home in accordance with classical ideals. This Greco-Roman portico in the front, it kind of looks like a Roman temple. It's even topped like a dome. So this very much looks like if he dropped the Pantheon in the middle of his house. So again, this is actually in the US, it would be called the federal style. Um, and he really advocated from this form of neoclassical style as an embodiment of the values of the new American Republic where Roman civic virtues of courage and patriotism would be reborn. So he really felt this neoclassic style was representative of the new United States or this brand new country that was developing. And if you look today, you see neoclassicism found all over Washington, D.C. Even here in Arkansas, our capital is very much in a neoclassic style. Um, the columns, the pediments, and these um, rounded... Uh, um, domes. So 
we really sort of took this style and embraced it and just sort of um, mimicked after it as the as the country moved west. So next time you're looking at some of your government buildings, kind of keep that in mind. And this actually comes from the neo the European neoclassic style. Okay, so let's move on to romanticism. And romanticism really is this new way of new wave of emotional expression. Uh, this was a time of revolution in both Europe and in America. People were rising up against the ruling classes. They were demanding freedoms. And a lot like neoclassicism, the importance of individual liberties are very much paramount to romanticism. Um, romantics celebrated nature, rural life, the common person, and that's where we're really going to look at this a lot, is the common people. They really asserted the validity of a subjective experience, basically saying each person has their own experience, and they really push this in their art. But they did it in a very moving and very expressive way, and a lot of the works really explored man's relationship with nature. Now, Liberty Leading the People is one of the most well-known paintings from this period. It's Eugene, Eugene Delacroix, and it's very much a focus on the common man in the age of the French Revolution. And Liberty here really became, or this figure of Liberty really became the symbol of the French Revolution. Um, if you've seen Les Mis, you really, you'll see this exact... Um, image at the at the end of the play or the musical and um it really was inspired this or it was inspired by this painting to write Les Mis so this was all based on the French people rising up against the government in a three-day July revolution in 1830 so if you notice the date on this is 1830 as well so this was painted right after this actually happened um, and Delacroix was in the midst of this. He was very much in the middle of all of the politics going on. Um, there were some questions on to which side he was on at one point, but he became very of the people and for the people. And um, he painted for, for the common people. Um, Delacroix was really much, much inspired by his teacher, who was Jericho. And the composition is close to Jericho's raft of the medusa the composition you can see is very close to jericho's painting um, from liberty leading the people and again the raft of medusa was based on actual events as well and actually it's even rumored that delacroix is the dead figure like half in half out of the water on the right front part of the painting the one where you don't see his head so much you just see part of his chin and the rest of the body that is rumored to be delacroix as well Okay, so let's move on to the death of Sardanopolis. So, again, a very romantic idea, not in a sweet, loving romantic, but this doing what you believe for, um, for power or for um, freedom. And this is the death of Sardanopolis. This is actually based on a story um, that Sardanopolis, rather than surrender, takes poison and orders all of his favorite positions to be, or people, to be brought before him, possessions to be brought before him and destroyed and people that are killed. So all of his harem of women, all of his animals and everything, he burn, basically burns his house down rather than be taken prisoner. And so kind of this disillusionment with innocents who end up paying the price of those in power. So we have Sardanopolis sitting up there on his, literally on his kind of high bed, um, watching all of his, all of his harem of women being killed, his horses being drugged in. And you can see on the right side, the smoke starting to billow out as the room catches on fire. So again, kind of this idea of the power, powerful taking advantage of the less powerful and done so in this very moving way. There's a lot of, there's a high amount of emotion, high amount of movement. Everyone is in different poses. Um, it's kind of just this 
this all goes up to sort of this triangular composition with Sardanopolis at the top, but just so much activity and so much movement going on. This is definitely not the serene poses that we see with neoclassicism. Okay, and we've looked at this one before. Um, Frances Francesco Goya's 3rd of May, 1808, which was actually painted in 1814. And that does kind of cause a little bit of confusion sometimes. But this was the actual, the actual, um, Activity took place 3rd of May, 1808, but he painted this six years later in 1814. And this really is, again, a representation of citizens sacrificing for the ideas of liberty and equality and very much a focus on humanity, the common man. Um, this commemorates the Spanish resistance to Napoleon's occupation of Madrid and um, we see the French soldiers lined up, pointing their guns at this poor Spanish pop, this poor Spanish figure. And I believe we mentioned when we talked about this before, how he's very Christ-like. He has his hands up in this almost crucifixion pose where he is facing his killers down um, with dead, with his dead friends and family surrounding him. So very much showing the courage of the common man. And here we have Blake. Um, you may know him as a poet, but he was also a very prolific artist and created lots and lots of um, paintings and prints throughout his lifetime. And he, with, along with his poetry, he would of, often illustrate them and either he or his wife would uh, color them in. And this is Elam creating Adam or actually the same subject as we saw with um, the Sistine Chapel ceiling with Michelangelo's creation of Adam. And um, Blake never, he didn't say God for the most part. He had this um, immortal being called Elohim, that Elohim. Um, and he does a lot of the same things that we think of as kind of the overreaching God or Jesus figure even. Um, and he looks very much like this god or guardian figure. And so we see him come in and out of Blake's illustrations quite often. And he even tells stories with him with, with him that um, coincide with biblical stories as well. So, um, but this is much more different. There's a lot more movement here. There's much more emotion rather than them just reaching hands out to one another and Poof, he's in existence. Um, Elam is kind of just dragging him from the earth here. We even see these um, this kind of serpent tail wrapped around him, suggestive of the snake um, and what's to come with Adam. So we really see a lot more emotion, a lot more powerful um, interaction between these two figures. Okay. Now, when we talk about landscape in Romantic art, the first person that's always going to come to mind is um, Joseph, Joseph Millard William Turner, or J.M.W. Turner, and he painted a lot of pictures exploring the effects of kind of this idea of an elemental vortex. So when you look at this, you're going to see these swirling colors, um, heavily, highly, highly active, and very much movement of different types of weather. We'll see storms, we see rainstorms, we see snowstorms, um, and just really the suggestion of the movement of the paint itself. So, and he has this idea of this vortex. And when I say vortex, it's kind of this circular point that comes to the middle of the painting. And he really works with the idea of the sublime. Now, the sublime in art really is described as awe-inspiring or fearful. Think of it as very much beautiful from, full from afar, but would be terrifying to be in. Think of a thunderstorm or um, the waves churning on the ocean during a storm when you're sitting on the beach watching it or you're sitting from you know, a condo window or something and watching the storm come across the ocean. It's beautiful to see 
but to actually be in it would probably be disconcerting or rather uh, rather kind of terrifying. So um, in here you see the steamboat off the harbor's mouth and the boat really represents mankind's futile attempts to combat the forces of nature. And um, when we look at landscape and romantic art, often it is man versus nature. And um, usually it's the power of nature over man, not so much the power of man over nature. So kind of keep that in mind. It's an easy way to sort of identify as if you really see the power of nature overcoming a man-made craft, a boat or a train or something along that lines, then it's likely a romantic painting. Um, and then this is also Turner's slave ship. And this is a, again, a true story, um, much like we looked at with Delacroix and it, with Jericho's paintings. Um, this is something that actually happened. Um, this is slave ship or slavers throwing overboard the dead and dying because a typhoon is coming on. And this is the true story of the slave ship Zong from the 18th century um, that had thrown over the sick and dying slaves in order to collect insurance money because they were worth more dead with the typhoon coming than losing the ship. So the slaves were considered property and it was better to, to collect the insurance money on the lost cargo or the slaves than to let the ship sink. And so Turner is really expressing the horror of this. Um, and you see the ship going into, you see the sun behind it or the sunrise behind it. And you see the ship um, going into almost the stormy waters. If you notice to the bottom right of the painting, you can see a foot coming out of the ocean and you can see the fish attacking it and eating the, basically eating the dead. And this just gives you a little bit closer of a look to that. So he really doesn't put the slave and you see the shackle or you can even see the shackle on the ankle still of this showing that this is a slave and um, they're obviously going completely under and the fish, they've been fed to the fishes basically. And so Turner's really trying to capture the horror of this awful, awful action. And then this heavy impasto that he does, this very thick texture on his painting, really adds to the roughness of this subject. The oranges, the reds, and the yellows of the sunset also really helped contribute to this idea of things going down. Okay, so this is the last painting that we're going to look at in this section, and this is the Oxbow. This moves from European art into American art. Um, and this is at the Metropolitan Museum in New York. Um, this is by Thomas Cole, who was born in England, but actually came to America at the age of 18. And his family lived in Ohio, which was at that time on the edge of the wilderness. And then he worked in Ohio and Philadelphia before settling into New York. And as Cole painted, he really imbued messages about the country and his landscapes. So he paints these pretty views, but he also makes sure that they're meaningful um, somehow to the American, the American uh, landscape and the American people. Um, this, the full name of this is a view from Mount Holyoke, Northampton, Massachusetts after a thunderstorm. So, but most commonly it is referred to as the Oxbow. And the Oxbow is talking about this bend that you see in the river because it looks like the looks like the yoke that you would put over an ox um, when they go to plow fields. So this is an ox bow, a very common term for this kind of bend. Um, this was a highly recognizable spot on the river, so anyone looking at it would know exactly where this was. And if you start looking at this painting, you see a very distinctive difference between the two sides of it. On the right, we have these very cultivated fields. It's broken up into different patches. You can kind of see where crops have been planted. Um, and again, much like as if we were flying over in an airplane today, you'd see almost this patchwork of forms where the land has been tamed. And then on the left, we see the storm coming through still, and you even see a little bit of lightning on the far left side of the painting, about halfway down. 
Um, and you see this wilderness and this wild um, lightning blasted tree in the very front. And you see lots of, of what the American frontier would have looked like before it was tamed in their eyes. And so this really represents the idea of manifest destiny. Um, westward expansion shown to really positively shape the land that it was that we were divinely ordained to settle the land. So um, again, a beautiful landscape. Um, there's lots of things that tell us that manifest destiny is the correct thing um, because this wild landscape was good for no one. Um, and the idea that the settled provided food and nutrition and things to those around them. Um, there's also a really interesting thing if you look at the mountain, and it's very hard to read in this image, um, but you can go online again and kind of zoom in close. If you look at the small mountain kind of in the middle of the painting, um, just above the ox bow, you'll notice what almost looks like sort of random letters written into it. It actually is the word Noah written in Hebrew upside down on the mountain. And the reason it's done upside down, so God could look down on the mountain and read it. Um, read it, if you read it upside down, it spells out Shaddai the Almighty. So really this is showing that um, this cultivated land and this developing landscape that we have had in America at this time was ordained by God. Okay, well, this wraps us up for section 3.7 and we will continue next week with realism and beyond. Um, for now, you just have to take this week's quiz to wrap up the, uh, the required work. See you next week.